The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them into your children, speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. Bind them on your wrist as a sign, let them be a pendant on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your houses and on your gates. If we truly believe these words from the book of Deuteronomy, passing on the faith is not an option, it's an imperative. God charged Israel with this great commandment and wants us to keep these words in our hearts, to get them outside of ourselves and into the next generation. We need to talk about the Lord. We need to do this when we are at home. We need to do it when we walk down the street. We need to do it when we are with others and write the God's words on the doorpost and the bathroom mirrors and the refrigerator doors and on the dashboards of our cars. In other words, we have to know and live out this commandment to pass on the faith and to pass it on especially to our children and our children's children. It kind of kills the theory that faith is something very private. If we are faithful, then our faith in God means something to us, then we will strive to follow His Word and live it out as He tells us. Then our faith is anything but private. We must pass it on. We must talk about it. We tell the story of our faith to our children and to the people that God has put in our path. The great evangelizer is Christ, the Word made flesh, the missionary of the Father, the anointed of the Spirit who founded the church as an extension of himself. Today, the same Jesus gathers us as his church and instructs us with his gospel and nourishes us with his sacraments. Having come to share our life, he invites us to share his mission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Evangelization is the mission of the church, which is itself an extension of Jesus Christ, who is the magister, the teacher. He wants to communicate to us life in abundance. The mission of the church is about making disciples, helping people respond to the call to holiness by being part of a faith-filled, worshiping community struggling to be faithful to the gospel. Discipleship is about living with Christ in a faith community, striving to model our lives on his teaching and example. Now, this isn't something new in the history of the church. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. One of the first attempts is documented in a stunning book that comes to us from the first century. It's called the Didache, which means the training. It was the first training manual for initiating people into the life of the church. It was memorized by the mentors or teachers who used it as a lesson plan, a catechism, a liturgical worship aid, and primer for faithful discipleship. This Didache described the step-by-step transformation by which converts were to be prepared 
for a full active participation in the life of the church. The Didache shows us that for the church, teaching the faith is always a process of mentoring. Then as now, we're not transmitting our own theories or notions, but speaking and hopefully witnessing to the Word of God. The Word of life can never be received simply as information. And the mentor is expected to illustrate, inquire, question, listen, and challenge his candidate in such ways that not only the words, but the deeper meaning of the way of life were being suitably assimilated at every step. The Didache also tries to prepare its novices for the rejection by their friends, relatives, and by the dominant culture, which is often hostile to the gospel teachings. Another early writing from that first century that's always fascinated me is the letter to Dirnietus, where the author is describing for his friend what Christians are like. He says, they live in the same neighborhoods, they speak the same language, dress like everybody else, but they don't kill their babies and they respect the marriage bond. Very quaint indeed. It's a little scary to think that the Dionetus letter could have been written last week instead of 2,000 years ago. In today's world, Catholic education must be didache, training in a way of life which is increasingly alien in the secular world, where our concern about unborn children or the sacredness of marriage makes us seem quaint or even nettlesome. We need mentors, parents, godparents, grandparents, teachers, youth ministers, neighbors, who are ready to pass on the faith to a new generation. The area where perhaps we're the most efficient and which hampers our attempts to pass on the faith is that of adult faith formation, which needs to reach out to three different groups. First, all who are our active parishioners, those who are our volunteers, the lay ministers, and committed Catholics. We need to help them to have a deeper understanding of the faith and enjoy the richness of the scriptures, the catechism, the social encyclicals, the spiritual masters, and the medical ethics that make up our teaching. We also need outreach to the unchurch, to those who are coming to us to join our community by having an excellent RCIA program and teams that are ever finding new ways to invite people to consider to join the church. Scripture, apologetics, and early Christian writers are important sources for our attempts to help new Catholics and prospective Catholics to discover the church's treasures. The last group, the inactive Catholics, is perhaps the most difficult. And here we need much reflection, prayer, and planning. There are at least 17 million individuals in the United States who for reasons great and small have stormed off, dozed off, or simply fallen through the cracks we have a responsibility to them. Christmas, Easter, weddings, and funerals are moments when these inactive Catholics find themselves in church. We must learn to make the most of these moments to welcome people home and put, them on, put on the church's very best face. We need to assume some responsibility for reaching out to these brothers and sisters who have walked away or just drifted away. Our belief must be in a God who so loved the world that he sent us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to establish a people, a church entrusted with his mission to make disciples of all nations and to build a civilization of love. 
we weren't baptized just for our own sake. I always say, if a scientist were to discover a cure for cancer or AIDS or Lou Gehrig's disease and then decided, well, I'm going to keep this for my family and my close circle of friends, people would say that's criminal. But we have something much greater than just a cure for cancer. We have our faith that can transform us and allow us to live with God forever. So the responsibility of sharing that is enormous. As a young priest, I was present at the Puebla Conference in Mexico. It was Pope St. John Paul II's very first trip after being elected Pope. When the Holy Father's plane landed in Mexico City, all the church bells in the country rang with joy. The successor of St. Peter was in our midst. The crowd extended along the highway from Mexico City to Puebla. People had come the day before and slept on the highway. It reminded me of that passage in the Acts of the Apostles where St. Luke describes how the people put their sick by the side of the road so that Peter's shadow would touch them. That crowd surpassed millions and millions of people. The government had tried to discourage people from going. Nobody paid any attention to that plea. But afterwards, it was interesting because the government officials reported that there were no troublesome incidents due to the crowds as they had feared. And indeed, the crime rate had fallen to an all-time low while the Pope was in the country. The government speculated that even the burglars and the pickpockets went for the Pope's blessing. The Holy Father, when he arrived in Puebla, got out of this open car, walked across a soccer field to a makeshift altar, and celebrated the opening mass of the Puebla Conference. I shall never forget his homily. He challenged us to be teachers and to teach the truth about Christ, about the church, about the human person. The same message is as crucial for us today. The content of our teaching must embrace all of these truths, the truth about Christ, the Son of God, true God and true man, our crucified Redeemer, our risen Lord, who has promised to be with us always and who establishes his church on the rock of Peter. The truth about the church, founded by Jesus and the apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, gathering God's people around the altar, calling people to discipleship, conversion, and ministry a church teaching with authority, witnessing to the presence of the risen Lord, serving Christ, especially in the poor and the downtrodden, the truth about the human person, that each of us is an irreplaceable mystery made in God's image and likeness, called to an eternal destiny. The church's teachings on human rights the gospel of life, sexual morality, and social justice are all corollaries of this great truth about our origins and our destiny. Many years ago, I was invited to a state dinner at the White House for the president of Brazil, who'd been invited by President Bush Sr. at the time. And they wanted a Portuguese-speaking bishop to be there. So they were very surprised when an O'Malley showed up. But they sat me down, sitting between President Bush and this lovely young lady who introduced herself as Gloria Estefan. And I said to her, do you work in the White House? Uh, she was a very good sport. She said, no, Father, I'm a famous singer. But she obviously knew that a friar wouldn't necessarily be acquainted with all of the cultural icons. So she was very patient with me. But indeed, we live in a world that is obsessed with celebrities. And celebrities have often replaced our heroes for our young people. And oftentimes, these celebrities, for all their good looks, their talents in singing, acting, and sports, lead lives that are superficial, self-absorbed, and chaotic. The church has always held up for us 
the lives of the saints. They provide examples of what the universal call to holiness means. The saints model for us the struggle to overcome our human weakness and sinfulness and embrace God's will in our lives. It's healthy for our young people today to hear about our saints and contemporary heroes like Dorothy Day, who after having an abortion and another child out of wedlock, became one of the most outstanding persons in the history of our church in the United States. Young people want to see the ideals of the Gospels lived in our lives. One of the worst results of scandal in the church is the cynicism about the call to holiness. We run the risk of being overwhelmed by the bad example of our leaders. And we need to be reminded that there have always been saints and sinners in the church. The church's task is to call everyone to conversion. We have our successes and our failures. The saints are the success stories for our young people need to know. It helps them to see that we, their teachers, are struggling on the same path to holiness. We must also break the bad habit of presenting the church in such a way that people are deceived into thinking that they can be Christians and remain strangers. The privatization of religion in today's climate of New Age individualism is poisonous to the gospel message of community, of connectedness in the body of Christ. In a culture addicted to entertainment, our young Catholics often find Sunday Mass a rather unsatisfying experience. Our challenge is to help our young Catholics experience prayer so that when they gather for the Sunday Eucharist, they have a notion of why they are there and how to pray. There can be no Catholic life, no holiness, no discipleship without prayer. Every Catholic school, every religious education program must have a strong prayer component that will help all of our Catholics to be part of a worshiping community. It is gathering around the altar that we recognize Christ in the breaking of the bread and where by partaking of the Eucharist, we become one with the Lord and with one another. Our challenge is to help our people glimpse the beauty of God, the beauty of the gospel, but we must first experience it ourselves in our own interior life, in our journey inward. We must love the church. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's never the widower. He does not exist separate from the church. I've always liked that ancient Christian text, The Shepherd of Hermes. It's a book of revelations granted to Hermes in ancient Rome by agency of two heavenly figures, the first an old woman and the second an angel in the form of a shepherd. The old woman represents the church. In successive visions, she becomes younger and more beautiful. As Hermes moves on the path of conversion, the vision of the church's beauty becomes more and more apparent to him. The path to holiness is a path to the source of all beauty and goodness, the absolute beauty of God. The character Prince Michkin in Dostoevsky's The Idiot puts it so well. He says, beauty will save the world. We want to share with new generations that being a Catholic with a sense of vocation and a communal mission is a beautiful life. Our mission is about helping people to glimpse that beauty that saves us.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the blessing of Almighty God, through the intercession of Our Lady and Saint Joseph, descend upon you, your loved ones, and your homes, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.